So now the recording is on. The next thing is to stop the transcription. And before I begin, I need to find out if you guys can hear my voice. So can you guys hear me? Please, yes. Yes. Okay, then the next thing is to find out if you can see the slides. So can you guys see the slides? Okay. Okay, that's fine. So today we are looking at causal reasoning. In our last class, we were talking about inductive reasoning. So we talked about inductive reasoning in our last class. And so today we are looking at causal reasoning. Now, as you know, this is a course that deals with different ways we reason about issues. At this point, um, you are supposed to have trained yourself on the procedures of deductive and inductive reasoning. <clears throat> and so causal reasoning is a type of inductive reasoning that focuses on causal relationships. It's a type of inductive reasoning that focuses on causal relationships. That's reasoning from cause to effect and sometimes from effect to cause. So what causes what, you know, how do we know it is the cause? Now, we have to begin by understanding different senses of the word cause. When we say something caused something, what kind of cause are we talking about? So let's look at the different senses of cause. First of all, we have proximate cause, which is the immediate cause of something, even if that thing has more remote and foundational causes. Proximate cause is the immediate cause of something. Example, Samson decided to become an armed robber. They put him in a situation where he engaged in a shootout with the police and the police killed him. And so the proximate cause of Samson's death is the decision to become an armed robber, which of course is what ultimately caused the shootout. Now, proximate or immediate cause would suggest to you that there are other causes you know, and so let's look at what we call a contributory cause. You know, uh, a contributory cause is a cause among many other causes. So when there are two or more causes, then each of them you can call it a contributory cause. For example, a distressed economy contributed to Samson's decision to become an armed robber and hence to end up being killed by the police. You know, so a contributory cause is a cause among other causes. So a distressed economy contributed to Samson's decision to become an armed robber. Then we have necessary cause or cause as necessary condition. When something is a necessary condition for another thing, without it, the other would not exist. Example, without oxygen, life is impossible. Okay. Now we have sufficient cause or cause as sufficient condition. Something could be a sufficient condition for something if the presence of that thing is adequate for the presence of the effect. <coughs> when something is adequate <coughs> for an effect, then you say it's a sufficient cause. One does not need to express doubt at seeing the effect when she sees the condition or the cause. Example, to be prevented from inhaling oxygen for 20 minutes is sufficient condition for death. <clears throat> to be prevented from inhaling oxygen for 20 minutes is sufficient condition for death. So <clears throat> a sufficient cause is when <clears throat> something is adequate for an effect to take place. Now. <clears throat> Let's see another example of sufficient cause. <coughs> proving that a healthy and sane person, proving that a healthy and sane person calculatedly committed a murder is an adequate condition for sentencing a person to life imprisonment if this is the appropriate sentencing for such a crime in that jurisdiction. So let's assume in a criminal case 
it has been established or confirmed that someone committed murder or homicide. And in addition to his having committed such a crime, it is also confirmed that the same person is healthy, including mentally healthy. So he or she committed murder or homicide, and he or she is also mentally healthy. So those conditions are adequate for a life imprisonment sentence or a death penalty, depending on what is the punishment. So those conditions are adequate. <clears throat> now we could have individually necessary and jointly sufficient conditions. So we can say there are several individually necessary conditions for an effect and that a combination of those conditions becomes sufficient for effect. Now, the fact that something is a necessary cause doesn't mean it's a sufficient cause. For example, water is a necessary cause for life. Oxygen is a necessary cause of life. But none of them is a sufficient, is a sufficient cause for life. <clears throat> now, in life and in science, it's usually difficult to determine what number of case causes are jointly sufficient for an effect to occur. You know, so it is easier to identify a necessary cause than a sufficient cause. Now, so you can easily identify oxygen as a necessary cause for life, cause of life. You can also identify food as a necessary cause of life, but none of them is sufficient for life. Now, if you are told to identify the sufficient cause of human life, would you be able to find it? Now, to find the sufficient cause of human life, you would need to find all the necessary causes of life and put them together. And they must be complete before life is realized or before human life is realized. <clears throat> so when you bring together oxygen, water, food, health, sunlight, the question is whether you have assembled all the complete conditions for life. And the answer might be no, because you might bring all this together and yet you don't have human life. So the question becomes, what is the sufficient condition or sufficient cause of human life? Probably you need to add a spiritual principle that causes human life as well. You know? So we don't know. So it's usually more difficult to find, is to establish a sufficient condition than it is to establish a necessary condition. In life and in science, it's usually difficult to determine what number of causes are jointly sufficient for an effect to occur. So example, oxygen, water, food, and health are independently necessary conditions for a human being to stay alive, but they, and some other factors we may not know yet, are sufficient for staying alive. Then we have probabilistic cause. Now, probabilistic cause is the opposite of necessary cause. It is the opposite of necessary cause. This kind of cause is theoretically not necessary, not a must for the effect. Example, a crisis within the economy, the lack of a job, and the need to marry and settle down are probable causes of Samson's decision to become an armed robber. So a probable cause is the opposite of necessary cause. It's not a must. So a crisis in the economy may have caused Samson to become an armed robber, but it is not a must. It's not a necessary cause of armed robbery because many of us grew up in a crisis in the economy and we, were not, we did not become armed robbers. So none of these causes, crisis in the economy, lack of job, and need to marry and settle down are necessary for Samson to become an armed robber. Causal agent as cause. A causal agent is also a cause. Example, Clement cost or Clement is a cause of the crisis. So causal agents have to do with living things like human beings, other animals. They are causal agents.
Then we have causal chain and causal web. Now, causal chain is when there are so many causes, each one leading to another. And causal web is when the relationship between causes is more like a web than a chain. When the relationship between causes is more like a web than a chain. So you can have two contributory causes uh, occurring simultaneously. So causal chain is when there are so many causes, each one leading to another, you know, that's what they call a causal chain. For causal web, it is several causes contributing to the same effect side by side, simultaneously at the same time. And that would be more like a causal web than a causal chain. For example, so let's see examples of both of them. This one is an example of causal chain. Now causal chain, Samson graduated but could not find a job. He attempted self-employment but did not show enough determination to succeed in his chosen craft. Then he went to a bar one day and met a friend who introduced him to a gang. Samson agreed to join the gang because he was hungry and out of cash. He joined the gang and became an armed robber. He and his gang had a number of successful robberies, but on one of those escapades, they ran into the police. There was a shootout and Samson was hit. Samson was rushed to a hospital where he died of gunshot injuries. So we have a chain of causes of Samson's death, beginning from his graduation and inability to find a job. So it is just a case of one cause leading to another, and then another cause leading to another, and so on. So when a cause leads to an effect, that effect itself becomes a cause leading to an effect. And then the new effect becomes a cause leading to another effect. That's a causal chain. Then we have an example of a causal web. Now for a causal web, it could be that the police officer who killed Samson did so because he, the officer, aimed his gun correctly, while his colleagues did not. And at the same time, Samson got killed because he squeezed his trigger to kill the police person before the police person killed him, but found that there were no more bullets in the firing chamber of his gun. Now, so this is a causal web. Several things happening at the same time. The police officer aimed his gun correctly at Samson. Samson also aimed his gun probably correctly at the policeman. Both of them may have squeezed their trigger at the same time. But the difference is that there was no more bullets in Samson's gun, but there were still bullets in the policeman's gun. So that explains who got killed and who remained alive. So because all these things were happening at the same time, we would call it a causal web. Now let's do a little exercise, or a few exercises. <clears throat> I can trace Nanado's victory all the way to an advice his father gave him when he was a child. I can trace Nanado's victory all the way to an advice his father gave him when he was a child. This is an example of a proximate cause contributory probabilistic cause or causal chain. So does anyone have an idea what it could be? Okay, so to save time, let's go ahead and analyze the question in order to find the answer. Now to answer, to answer the question, we have to look at the question more closely. I can trace the Nado's victory all the way to an advice his father gave him. So when you see the phrase all the way, the phrase all the way automatically tells you it will be a causal chain, a causal chain, because it's talking about all the way. So we are talking about a chain of causes. US
Okay, so USA has a hand in the killing, in the ousting and killing of Patrice Lumumba. <clears throat> USA has a hand in the ousting and killing of Patrice Lumumba. This is an example of a proximate cause, contributory, probabilistic, causal chain. Now, to answer the question, you look at the question more closely. USA has a hand. Now, the phrase has a hand suggests to you it is a contributory cause because has a hand suggests that there are more causes, many, many more causes. And has a hand suggests that this is a cause among other causes. So the phrase has a hand tells you this is a what? A contributory cause. You need to at least pay a house rent if you wish to live in that house. You need to at least pay a house rent if you wish to live in that house. This is an example of a, a contributory cause, probabilistic, necessary, sufficient cause. So to answer the question, you look at it more closely. You need to at least pay a house rent. Now the phrase at least, the phrase at least tells you it is what? A necessary cause. The person is saying that even if you can't fulfill all other conditions, it is necessary you fulfill at least one condition. So the phrase at least is pointing at a necessary condition, a necessary cause. But the necessary condition for living in that house is to pay the house rent. Are you aware that the lady you dated is the reason why you did not do well in your exams? This is an example of a necessary cause, contributory, probabilistic, causal agent. So that would be what? That would be causal agent. Anything that has to be with a human being or living thing as cause is causal agent. <clears throat> A lot of factors contributed to the emergence of the idea of multiculturalism. First, World War II ended with the defeat of the Nazis, who wanted to conquer the world and put everyone under a single ideology. Second, it was the era of independence, and most former colonies were acquiring their independence, which was a message of equality and mutual tolerance. Third, African Americans in America were demanding for respect and equal treatment. <clears throat> Fourth, the United Nations had made a declaration on the fundamental human rights. This is an example of a contributory cause, probabilistic cause, causal chain, causal web. So, to find out the answer to this question, we need to look at the question very closely. A lot of factors contributed to the emergence of the idea of multiculturalism. So contributed, a lot of factors contributed means that several factors were contributing. So already that is suggesting what? Either causal chain or causal web or contributory cause. Now, first, World War II ended with the defeat of the Nazis. Now, the Nazis wanted a single ideology, but they were defeated. So that paved way for multiculturalism. And secondly, Many countries were acquiring independence. That also strengthened, strengthened the emergence of multiculturalism. Third, African Americans in America were demanding for respect and equal treatment. So that was also adding strength to the emergence of multiculturalism. And then fourth, the United Nations came out with a declaration on the fundamental human rights, which added a lot of strength to emergence of multiculturalism. So all these things were contributing to the emergence of multiculturalism. Were they contributing in a causal chain or a causal web? Since they were all happening around the same period, it means that they were contributing in a causal web. So the answer would be what? Causal web. 
She died because she drank a heavy dose of poison. This is an example of what? Now, a heavy dose of poison is sufficient for what? For death. So it will be a sufficient cause. So that's that about the different senses of the word cause, the different meanings of cause, different ways in which we can have a cause. Now, let us look at the different ways in which we human beings identify causes every day. Now, the human mind, the human mind has been imbued with certain natural ways of identifying causes. And it, we, we identify causes not just every day, but every minute and even every second. So what are the various ways in which the human mind identifies causes? We call them the informal causal reasoning patterns. The informal causal reasoning patterns. So those are the ways in which everyone, whether you are educated or not, identifies causes. So to find out, let's begin by saying that causal reasoning is a type of inductive argument attempting to establish the causal relationship between phenomena or events. A causal claim indicates that something causes another. Then a causal hypothesis is an initial speculation made in relation to a causal claim, a supposition offered as a starting point for further investigation. Now, we are supposed to be studying two things. First of all, we are supposed to look at the various informal causal reasoning strategies for arriving at causal claims. So that's what we're going to do now. And then we're also supposed to be looking at the various experimental strategies for confirming causal hypotheses. But that's not for this semester. So the experimental strategies will be for advanced uh, students who will be doing advanced uh, stages of uh, this course. So what concerns us today is what are the various ways in which our minds as normal human beings identify causes? In other words, what are the various informal causal reasoning patterns? Now, John Stuart Mill, in his book titled The System of Logic, seems to have identified five of such informal patterns by which we identify causes every day. Uh, he called them five approaches for detecting causation by personal observation. So out of the five approaches, we shall study three of them. And the three of them are the relevant difference reasoning, the common thread reasoning, and then the concomitant variation reasoning. So let's look at these three ways in which every one of us identifies causes every day. First, you have the relevant difference reasoning. Now, relevant difference is a method of reasoning that identifies something that will occur differently from others as the cause of an effect. Identifying something that will occur differently from others as the cause of an effect. For instance, A is the difference among others, so A caused the effect. A is the difference among others, so A caused the effect. Let's look at a practical example. I've always taken tea and bread for my breakfast, all my life, probably. But on a certain day last month, I fell sick shortly after my breakfast. I treated the illness and fell sick again last week after my breakfast. So I asked myself why I've fallen sick on these two occasions after breakfast. And then it occurs to me that on these two occasions, I had taken marmalade with a breakfast. So I checked the information provided on a marmalade container, and then I saw that the product has expired long ago. I suspect that this is the reason why I've fallen sick twice, especially after breakfast. So since I've always taken tea and bread without health implications, probably all my life, then the expired marmalade becomes the relevant difference, or the difference that is relevant in explaining the possible cause of the two illnesses. Then we have the common thread reasoning. Now, common thread 
is the reasoning of is the method of reasoning that identifies something that occurred in all the instances that have led to a particular effect. So you identify something that has occurred in all the instances that have led to a particular effect. So for example, A is a common thread among all the events. So A is the cause. A is a common thread among all the events. So A is the cause. Let's look at a practical example. <clears throat> When I bought the marmalade some months ago, I had gone shopping in the company of my neighbors, and we had all bought the same stock of marmalade, which expired at the same time. Now, as you, my neighbors, are equally sick, they all trace the cause of their illnesses to the expired marmalade. It means we have all identified the expired marmalade as a common thread in all the instances of this particular illness in the neighborhood. So you can see that common thread is when something is in all the instances that are leading to a particular effect. Now, so um, relevant difference and common thread are often used together. If, for instance, there is a pandemic or there is an epidemic, you have to start by diagnosing at least one person to know what is the cause of the epidemic or pandemic. So, for instance, if you isolated one person and investigated that person to find out what is wrong with the person, you have to use relevant difference reasoning. You have to ask the person, what has been happening in your life that has not been happening before? What is the difference in your life that could be relevant in explaining this sickness? The person will tell you, and then that could help you to investigate, to confirm what the problem is. Based on what the person has told you, you can then do some investigations. You know, the person could tell you she has been having, he or she has had so 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 and so symptoms which he or she has never had in her life. And then, so you investigate the symptoms and with blood tests and other kinds of examinations, and then you come up with the answer, which uh, relevant difference reasoning helped you to achieve. Now, so if you have used relevant difference in finding out the problem of one person in the population, then the next thing is to ask yourself if the same problem is what is running through all the other people in the population that are having the same problem. If you confirm that, then you have used common thread reasoning to identify the problem in the first person, in the other persons as well. So you use both relevant difference reasoning and common thread reasoning to find out what caused an epidemic or a pandemic. Then the, the third method of identifying causes, concomitant variation, is different from relevant difference and uh, common thread. Now it is different because it uses a totally different way of identifying causes. Now relevant difference and common thread uh, are aimed at finding out the presence or absence of something in the environment in order to determine whether there's a problem. But concomitant variation does not aim to determine a, a, a mere presence or absence of the cause of something, the cause of a problem. Rather, it aims to study the degree of occurrence or intensity of something in the environment. Now, concomitant variation, this is a method of identifying the degree of occurrence of something rather than its simple presence or absence. Now, it is used when we cannot eliminate a particular cause from the environment, for example, carbon dioxide. You know, so it is useless to use relevant difference to identify carbon dioxide as a cause of ill health. Now, you know that carbon dioxide is always in the atmosphere. The air we breathe con must contain carbon dioxide. You know, so if you cannot eliminate carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, you cannot use the relevant difference reasoning to identify whether carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is causing a particular illness. 
Now, if you suspect that carbon dioxide in, in the atmosphere is causing a particular illness, then since it is always in the atmosphere, your question will be, what is the degree of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? Is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, has it exceeded the normal degree? If it has exceeded the normal degree, then that is why it is causing some illness. So that's why we said it is useless to use relevant difference to identify carbon dioxide as a cause of ill health. You use a method that measures its degree or intensity. For example, it was revealed through research that high blood pressure is exacerbated in regions whose soils have low levels of selenium. Now, this is a metal that exists in tiny quantities in every soil, and because of this, we cannot measure for its absence or presence. We can only account for the effects of varying degrees of it, and hence the discovery that it seems correlated with the ability of our bodies to keep our blood pressure normal. So every soil contains selenium. The question is, at what quantity, what degree is it in the soil? If the degree is too low, then those living above that soil will be having high blood pressure. So if you want to find out why people are having blood pressure, you might want to test the degree or intensity of selenium in the soil. Second example, it was discovered that high levels of sulfur dioxide pollution in the air was responsible for high rates of deaths in London between November and December 1952. Now, there's no way to eliminate sulfur dioxide from the air. The experiment rather discovered the causal connection by comparing the increase and decrease of the effect, that is the number of deaths per day, to the daily variation the daily variation in degrees of sulfur dioxide fumes in the air. So sulfur dioxide fumes, or sorry, sulfur dioxide is always in the air. You cannot eliminate sulfur dioxide from the air. So if you suspect that sulfur dioxide is causing a problem in the society, what you want to measure is what? The degree of sulfur dioxide in the air. And these guys, you know, we're taking stock of the number of deaths per day, which is the supposed effect, and comparing it, comparing the deaths per day to the degree of sulfur dioxide in the air for that day. You know, so each day, they record the number of deaths and then compare it to the level of sulfur dioxide. And that is how they discovered that high level of sulfur dioxide leads to a high rate of deaths. Now let's look at some exercises. Now we have seen the three informal causal reasoning patterns. Now a little exercise so that we can exercise our brains and then we can see how these things work and we know how to uh, perform in an examination or a test. Now, Kofi has had accidents with six of his cars in the last three months. Kofi has had accidents with six of his cars in the last three months. This is an example of a what? Relevant difference, common thread, concomitant variation, false common thread. So when you look at this question, you will see that Kofi, one person has had accident with six cars in just three months. So it means that Kofi is a common thread running throughout the six accidents. So the obvious answer will be what? Common thread. There's an unspoken understanding that those who were trained in European and American universities are better equipped for their jobs and should be given more promotions. Those who were trained in European and American universities are understood to be better equipped for their jobs and should be given more promotions. This is an example of a relevant difference, common thread, concomitant variation, false common thread. And so when you look at it very well, uh, you see that uh, training in Europe and America is 
seen as a common thread running through those who are better trained? Uh, so the answer should be either a common thread if it is true or a false common thread if it is not true. Now, some of us think that it is not true that those who were trained in European and American universities are better equipped for their job. So some of us will see it as what? A false common thread. Your computer is more likely to last longer if it's an Apple product. Your computer is more likely to last longer if it's an Apple product. This is an example of a what? Relevant difference, common thread, concomitant variation, false common thread. Now, when you look at it very well, you see that um, the ability of a computer to last is a consequence of the materials there. How, you know, how durable, how durable its hardware is. Now, every computer has a hardware. The hardware refers to the physical computer you are seeing and touching. That's the hardware. The software is the invisible programs that are installed inside that run the system. That's the software. So the hardware, the materials used in constructing the hardware of a computer determine its durability, how long it will last. Now, so if the hardware of Apple products, you know, uh, makes Apple products last longer than other products, then it means that uh, that, that Apple products were invested with uh, tougher material, stronger material. Uh, so all of them have hardware, but the hardware of Apple products is stronger or tougher. So it's just a degree of the strength of the hardware. You know, so that makes it a concomitant variation. Concomitant variation. One of the reasons why Michael saw six where others have failed is that he studies his problems carefully before taking action. One of the reasons why Michael succeeds where others have failed is that he studies his problems carefully before taking action. This is an example of a relevant difference, common thread, concomitant variation, false common thread. Now, so we are told that Michael succeeds where others have failed. So that means that points to a kind of difference. Michael is different. That's number one. And then he's different because he does what? Because he does something that others don't do. He does something that others don't do. So he's not only different, but his approach to solving problems is also different. <clears throat> so that difference, he studies his problems carefully. It's a difference that is relevant in explaining why he succeeds where others have failed. So that's what? Relevant difference. That's relevant difference. Now, male soccer teams from Cameroon are always filled with tall, hard-bodied men. My father said it is because of the prominence of plantain, a key provider of zinc in the average Cameroonian diet. This is an example of a relevant difference, common thread, concomitant variation, false common thread. Now, so what will be the answer? We look at the question more carefully. Now, we're told that male soccer teams from Cameroon are always filled with tall, hard-bodied men. And then um, Cameroonians eat a lot of plantain. Now, is it only Cameroon, <coughs> sorry, is it only Cameroonians that eat, <coughs> that eat plantain? No, everyone eats plantain. You know, Ghanaians and other Africans also eat plantain. But it looks like from this passage, Cameroonians eat plantain higher or at a higher degree compared to other Africans. And that is now presented as a reason why their soccer teams are filled with tall, hard-bodied men. So if it is a fact or if it is a supposition that they eat more plantain, compared to other Africans, then it's a question of the degree of plantain that is consumed. So that makes it what? A concomitant variation. The answer is concomitant variation. 
Now it has been discovered that living longer is associated with low protein intake at middle age and moderate to high protein intake in old age. Living longer is associated with low protein intake at middle age and moderate to high protein intake in old age. So is it relevant difference, common thread, concomitant variation, false common thread? Now, protein intake, living, now this is about the relationship between the length of life and the intake of protein. How much protein would you take to live longer? Now, the first question we'll ask ourselves, is there anyone that doesn't eat protein? No, everyone eats protein. So what is the issue? The issue is the degree of protein, the quantity, the degree of protein eaten. So this research happens, seems to be suggesting that those who eat protein at a certain degree live longer than others. So if it's about the degree of protein that has been eaten, then it is concomitant variation. The answer will be concomitant variation. So that's that about the three informal causal reasoning patterns or the three informal causal reasoning strategies. Now, um, <clears throat> let's look at some causal fallacies or fallacies of causal reasoning, or let's say bad causal reasoning. We've been looking at good causal reasoning. Now it's time to look at some bad causal reasoning. Now, causal fallacies are committed when the link between an alleged cause and effect depends on a causal link that does not exist. So a causal fallacy will be an allegation of causation that is not true. An allegation of causation that is not true. So the first example will be the fallacy called the post hoc ego propter hoc. The post hoc ego propter hoc, or the fallacy of inferring causality from chronology inferring causality from chronology. Example, for the first time today, I took beans for breakfast. For the first time today, I took beans for breakfast. And I performed wonderfully in my mathematics test. Therefore, therefore, a breakfast of beans is very crucial to mathematical proficiency. You know, so because I took beans for the first time today, and then I performed very well in mathematics for the first time, I am tempted to think that the two of them are causally related, that the beans might have caused the proficiency. But that will require investigations, scientific investigations to confirm that beans can cause mathematical proficiency. But we already know that mathematical proficiency is caused by practicing mathematics, not by eating any food, any kind of food. Of course, we know we need proteins and vitamins to be healthy and for our brains to function properly. But ultimately, proteins and vitamins cannot give you any mathematical proficiency. Mathematical proficiency must come from practicing mathematics. So we would say it's a fallacy called the post hoc ego propter hoc. Another example would be the president and the vice president had an argument before the economic recession. The president and vice president had an argument before the economic recession. Therefore, the argument between the president and the vice president is the, is the cause of the economic recession. We wouldn't know about that. You know. That could be inferring uh, causality from chronology. Just because the president and the vice president had an argument before the economic recession doesn't mean that the argument caused the economic recession. Now let's look at another fallacy called the non-causa pro-causa, non-causa pro-causa, or the fallacy of exchanging or confusing cause for effect. The fallacy of exchanging or confusing cause for effect. For example, Michael is a poor student because he performs poorly in examinations. Michael is a poor student because he performs poorly in examinations. But that's uh, exchanging cause for effect. The correct thing is that Michael performs poorly in examinations because he's a poor student, not the other way around. It is because he's a poor student that he performs poorly in examinations. 
Then we have oversimplified calls, oversimplified calls. Now, oversimplified calls is when there are so many causes or when there are many causes and then the argument identifies only one of them as a cause. When there are many causes and then only one of them is identified as the cause. Example, the Cameroonian team won the trophy because their coach is paid a higher salary. The Cameroonian team won the trophy because their coach is paid a higher salary. Now, a higher salary cannot lead to victory. You can pay a higher salary to a goat or a dog or a cow and tell the cow to be a coach, and the cow cannot coach anything. So a high salary cannot lead to trophies. But a high salary can lead to, can make a coach work harder. It can motivate a coach to do his best, to encourage his team, to train his team, to teach his team. And then the team in turn, in appreciation or obedience to their coach, can decide to play better. And then a trophy becomes possible. So all these things are involved, are causes of the trophy. To say that a high salary won a trophy is what we call oversimplified cause. Then we have false common thread. When we infer a common thread as a cause when it is not. Example, all the, academic, all the academically bright guys in my class have cars. So I'll get a car as part of my desire to be academically bright. Now, to be academically bright is to study hard. Owning a car without studying hard will not make you academically bright. So to identify the acquisition of a car as leading to academic brightness would be what? A false common thread. Even if all the bright guys in your class have, a, have cars, that could be purely accidental. You know. Confusing correlation with causation. Confusing correlation with causation. Just because two things occur together, just because two things often occur together doesn't mean there's a direct causal relationship between them. For example, each time a car moves, we see smoke coming from the exhaust tube. Therefore, the smoke causes the car to move. But that's wrong. The correct thing is that the smoke is not what causes the car to move. Both the movement of the car and the smoke itself are caused by the engine combustion. So the fact that two things always occur together doesn't necessarily mean that one of them is causing the other one. Both of them could be caused by something else. Then we come to the interesting fallacy we call slippery slope. Now, slippery slope is when we suggest that a relatively insignificant event will cause a more significant event which in turn will cause an even more significant event. And the order of significance continues to increase without adequate justification as to why each significant event will lead to a more significant event. You know, so slippery slope is to suggest that if something happens or if we do or say something, it will lead to this, then to that, then to the other one in an increasing seriousness or significance. A progressively dubious chain of premises, usually consequences, is often employed to support a conclusion or claim. Now, another explanation is, the, is to say that slippery slope is the fallacy of arguing that if A is allowed, it will trigger a set of events that eventually lead to Z. And it's only a matter of time to go from A to Z, to slip down a slippery slope from A to Z. Now, this should not be a fallacy if the causal movement from A to Z is justified. But it becomes a fallacy if the causal movement is not justified or justifiable, which means that it is what we call fatalism, an extreme version of determinism. Now, let's look at the first example. If Donald Trump becomes the president, America will fight many wars. Now, when Donald Trump was 
campaigning to become a president in 2016, some Democrats were telling us that if he becomes a president in 2016, America will fight many wars. Eventually, he became a president, but he did not put, he did not cause an additional war for America. So what they were saying in the 2016 presidential election campaign becomes what? It becomes a fallacy of slippery slope that if Donald Trump becomes a president, America will slip down a slippery slope into war. Now, it's a fallacy because Donald Trump, although Donald Trump is aggressive, Donald Trump could also control himself at certain points. For instance, if Donald Trump finds out that his actions or utterances are about to cause a war, he can decide to control himself and then the war will not happen. So that becomes a fallacy of slippery slope. Second example. It is wrong to believe in God, because then you would eventually believe in not just God, but all kinds of spirits. And then you come to believe that spirits have all kinds of power, which we call superstition. And then you come to believe that inanimate objects have spirits, which is animism. And then you come to believe that everything has spirits and power to do something or the other thereby ultimately destroying your ability to evaluate cause and effect in natural terms. <clears throat> so this argument is that if you believe in God, eventually your, your causal reasoning patterns will collapse. You wouldn't be able to identify cause and effects naturally because for you, everything is caused by God and spirit. So that's a slippery slope fallacy. Many people believe in God without even believing in other spirits or in superstition. And then many people also believe in God without believing in the capacity of inanimate objects to have spirits, which is animism. So that makes the argument a slippery slope fallacy. Let's look at a fourth example. I cannot allow my child to go outdoors and play in the compound. This is because if I do, she will jump fence and go into the streets. If she goes into the streets, she will run away with any stranger. If she runs away with any stranger, then I'll never see her again. If I never see her again, I'll be miserable for the rest of my life. If I'm miserable for the rest of my life, I would commit suicide. So for the purpose of the avoidance of suicide, I will not allow my child to play outdoors in my compound. So this is a slippery slope fallacy because if you allow your child to play in your compound, your child might not even jump the fence and go into the streets. Even if she jumps fence, she can jump the fence and jump back without going to the streets. Even if she jumps the fence and goes into the streets, she may not meet any stranger. Even if she jumps a fence and goes into the streets and meets with a stranger, she might decide not to go with a stranger. So there is no justification that all of these consequences will take place in a causal chain leading to suicide. There seems to be no justification for all these fears. So that makes it a slippery slope fallacy. Some brain teaser. So let's do some exercises. I noticed that most of the great people in this country attended their Chimota High School. I noticed that most of the great people in this country attended their Chimota High School. So I will attend that school because I want to be like them. This is an example of a false common thread, oversimplified cause, confusing correlation with causation, relevant difference. So let's look at the question closely. I noticed that most of the great people in this country attended their Chimota High School. 
But is it true that most people are ch attending the Achimota High School? Now, first of all, the Achimota High School is being presented as a common thread running through most of the great people in the country. Achimota High School is presented as a common thread running through most of the great people in the country. The question is whether it is true or not. Now, if it is true, then it will be a common thread. If it is not true, then it will be a false common thread. So which one is it? Now, I don't believe that most of the great people in the country attended Achimota High School. So the answer for me will be what? A false common thread. Russia's military, Russia's military is more powerful than the terrorist organization because the military destroyed the terrorist organization last week. This is an example of a post hoc ego propter hoc, non causa pro causa, confusing correlation with causation, slippery slope. Now we are told that Russia's military is more powerful because it destroyed a terrorist organization. So that seems to exchange cause for effect. Now the correct thing is that Russia's military destroyed the organization, the terrorist organization, because Russia's military is more powerful, not the other way around. So the answer will be what? non causa pro causa. I remember you visited a native doctor in January. I remember you visited a native doctor in January. That must be the problem behind the problems you are having with your business. Now, you visited a native doctor in January and now you are having problems with your business. So, the visit to the native doctor is being presented as a cause of the problems in business. So, that seems to be uh, inferring causality from chronology because the visit happened before the, the problems. The visit is being presented as a cause of the problems. So that is the fallacy called the post hoc propter ego hoc, or sorry, the post hoc ego propter hoc. Now the ego comes before the propter. You can attribute Gabriel's success as a lawyer to the support he receives from his wife. You can attribute Gabriel's success as a lawyer to the support he receives from his wife. This is an example of a false common thread over simplified cause, confusing correlation with causation, relevant difference. <clears throat> now, Gabriel's success is presented as a consequence of the support he receives from his wife. So in other words, the support of Gabriel's wife is being presented as the cause of his success. But is it possible that the support of a wife alone can cause someone's success? No. Even if somebody is receiving support from his wife and the person is lazy or the person is not doesn't is not focused. The person might not be a successful lawyer. So the support he receives from his wife cannot be the only reason for Gabriel's success. His success must also come from his hard work and also from his focus. So saying that his wife's support is the cause of his success is what? Is oversimplified cause. So the answer will be oversimplified cause. Now, each time I win a game of chess at the club, each time I win a game of chess at the club, I happen to have mistakenly used the wrong key to attempt to lock my front door. 
Each time I win a game of chess at the club, I happen to have mistakenly used the wrong key to attempt to lock my front door. So whenever I mistakenly use the wrong key to lock my front door, I know I will win a game of chess at the club. This is an example of a false common thread over simplified cause, confusing correlation with causation, relevant difference. Now, to find out the right answer, we need to look at the question more properly. We need to analyze the question. Each time I win a game of chess, I usually have mistakenly used the wrong key to attempt to lock my front door. So using the wrong key to attempt to lock my front door usually happens when I win a game of chess. So both of them are pre presented as a correlation that mistakenly using the wrong key to lock my front door happens when, whenever I win a game of chess. So whenever I do that, mistakenly using a front, uh, a, a, a wrong key to lock my front door, I know I'll win a game of chess. So now the two events are presented as uh, a correlation. And from correlation, a causality is inferred. Uh, so the argument is saying that the correlation is also a causal relationship, that the wrong key causes the victory. So that would be what? Confusing correlation with causation. Now it is a correlation because he said each time, each time he wins a game. So it is several times, not even once. And on each of them, he uses the wrong key. So it is being presented as a correlation. So the answer is what? Confusing correlation with causation. So that's the end of the class. Next week, we are going to look at informal fallacies. Now, uh, at this point, I will need to pause to uh, attend to any questions from anyone who has questions to ask before I begin to upload the recording for others who were not able to make it. So if you have any questions to ask, please ask your questions so that I can attend to them before I begin to upload the recording to your platforms. Okay, so since no one has a question, the next thing I'll do now is to stop the recording.